All right, you guys, as you can see by the thumbnail, I've got another one like the other one. So staying true to his word, once again, my guy reached out last night and dropped another one. This one right here, you guys are going to like this one. This one right here was kind of crazy. But again, a lot of these stories, the similarities, the parallels, it's almost like deja vu all over again. When I think back to things that happened within the NF or even within the, the Nuestra Raza, some of the hermanos in the past, they got caught up. And then some of the things that happened after they got caught up. It's a dirty game. You guys are going to like this one. This one's about another household name that you guys, I'm sure a lot of you have heard about before. So the Garys are another family that are deeply rooted within the Mexican mafia. The Garys, the Peewee, his little brother. And then I believe there's some, some, I, I think they got some primos or some some cousins that are also Mexican mafia members. But this is another family that is is tied in with the Mexican mafia. You hear about some of these families where there's multiple brothers, uncles, cousins, where they're all tied in. Well, this is a big family. They're from the avenues. Now, I was up in the bay with Psycho Aguirre, the one that this story is about right here. I wasn't in the same pod with him. I didn't really get to interact with him, but I was up there with him. I knew where he was at. We were in different pods, but I was in the same block as him in the 90s. So anyways, I'm going to get straight into this one right here. I want to thank everybody that dropped comments last night with regards to the story that I put out yesterday. Cold story. These stories, again, they're, they, they show you guys a lot of you that aren't familiar with how the politics work, just how cutthroat, how dirty things can get. I mean, it just don't get any better than this right here. So this story right here took place in the high desert on Sea Yard. So level four, another 180. So anyways, Psycho is over there at this time. And he's got this yard. He's got Sea Yard. And he sold up with an individual named Osito from 18th Street. Now, Osito's been in Selly for a while. They've been sold up together for, for months. And Osito's been hitting. He's been getting visits on a regular basis. His wife is coming up and she's she's bringing him dope. So, you know, he's he's having it his way. So just being sold up with Psycho, that puts him in a position to be privy to a lot of things that are going on on that yard. But also there's a lot of perks that come with it. Just, just being in the cell with Psycho. So, you know, one of the one of the policies that my guy was telling me about that, you know, they they had not only on this yard, but some of the other yards is that, you know, if you were somebody that was getting a visit and you were a sureño that was some, you know, not just a regular sureño, but like a camarada or somebody that was that was active, that were kind of tied in with that inner circle. If you got more than four visits, you were required to start bringing in dope, you know, because some guys, they don't get visits all the time. It's it takes a lot to drive all the way out there from Southern California. You know, it's a it's a long drive and people don't have the, the financial means to always go out there and visit. So, you know, you might get somebody that might get one visit a year or one visit the entire time that they're there. But if you're somebody that's getting visits on a regular basis and you got it like that, then you know, that's when they try to put their hooks in you and, you know, basically require you to start bringing in dope, to have your lady, your sister, your mom, whoever it is, muling that dope in, and that's just the way it goes. So anyways, Osito's been sold up with Psycho for a while, and, you know, they've got an arrangement worked out where because Osito's getting visits on a regular basis, his wife, she comes up every week like clockwork. She doesn't miss any visits. You know, she's been going up there. She brings the kids. They got a couple kids together. So, you know, she's somebody that has a car. She has the financial means to get out there. Now, because, you know, she's coming up there every week, at some point, him and Psycho work out an arrangement to where, you know, Psycho's wife starts carpooling with Osito's wife. So now she's coming up every week. And, you know, it's an arrangement that that works out for, for Osito because now he's winning. He doesn't got nothing to worry about. He is an asset to Psycho, so he don't got to worry about going on no, no removals or getting any, any trouble out there because Psycho needs him. 
He's an integral part of his setup. How he, you know, he establishes that yard, and especially when it's when it has to do with dope or money, that's something that Psycho doesn't want to mess up right there. So he's gonna make sure that Osito doesn't get in trouble out there. He doesn't get rolled up or or anything happens that will interfere with that setup. So, you know, Osito is not only bringing in dope for Psycho, he's also bringing in dope for himself. So. This, this also works out in his advantage as well because he doesn't have to worry about the, the same kind of kickbacks as the other Sureños who are hitting, you know, who, the ones that are hitting Glavo out there in the visiting room as well. I don't know what the percentage was as far as what they had to kick back, 25%, half, I don't know. I don't want to speak out of turn and just throw something out there. But whatever it was, they had an arrangement to where – However, you know, depending on how much they were getting, so much had to come back to the house. That's just the way it is. It's taxes. Taxes at its best. Anyway, so, you know, again, they're, they're sellies for a while. You know, every, everything's working out. Psycho appreciates the way that everything's working. His, his girl, she has a, a way to get up there every week. The dope's coming in. It's coming in like clockwork. She's never missing a week. And... You know his his lady's game. She's bringing it in. There's no problem. So, you know they're they're living in the cell. They're they're throwing spreads. They both got cell phones. So you know Osito is winning too just by being in the cell with Cycle. So, anyways, at one point, I guess, you know for whatever reason, however it happened, the visiting officers or Somebody said something for whatever happened. They start watching Osito's old lady. They start watching her. And one day when she goes up there for a visit, they search her extra hard. Like they really, they really go in on her. They, they make her feel uncomfortable. They pat her down. They just, they go through all her personal belongings. And it's obvious that they're looking for something or that somebody has said something that made them do what they're doing. They search everybody else and they they run them through, but they pull her aside and they got her, you know, they got her hemmed up on the side and, and they're going through all her stuff, almost to the point where it feels like she's being harassed. So obviously because of that, when Osito comes out for the visit, she tells him, she's like, hey, I don't know what's going on, but, you know, they searched me extra crazy when I, when I came in today. I think somebody's either saying something or, you know, they know they're watching us. So I'm, I'm, I'm uncomfortable. She's tripping now because, you know, she's worried about it. She Obviously, she doesn't want to go to jail. She doesn't want to get caught up. She's OK with bringing in the dope and she understands the situation. I'm sure that Osito explained to her the gravity of, you know, he's bringing in dope for the Mexican mafia. So this is something that it benefits him greatly for her to continue to keep doing it. But I'm sure, you know, when it comes to this, everybody, you know, they're worried about their security first and foremost before anything else. And if they think that there's a chance that they're going to get busted, then it's best to, to, you know, let things cool down and, you know, let, let it blow over whatever's going on before they resume regular program and start bringing it in again. So, you know, again, she comes up for this visit and they, they shake her up by the way that they searched her. It's obvious. They don't tell her, they don't tell her that, you know, we're, we're looking for drugs or somebody told us that you're bringing in drugs, but it's obvious the writing's on the wall. It's, you know, the way that they're, they're going through her stuff you know, she's smart enough to put two and two together. So she communicates that to Osito. He in turn expresses that to Psycho when he gets back to the cell, but he just kind of throws it out there. You know, he doesn't say that he's going to stop bringing it in. He just like, hey, bro, they're on my lady. You know, I don't know what's going on, but, you know, they, they hemmed her up and they went through all her stuff. They went through my kids stuff. So obviously they're either suspicious or they're looking for something. This wasn't no random type of thing. So, you know, when he brings it to Psycho, Psycho don't really say nothing. It's just a conversation that he kind of had and just was almost like he was talking to himself. So if he was looking for Psycho to, to give him any kind of, you know, like tell him that, hey, it's, it's good. Tell her to kick back. That didn't come. It didn't happen. You know, Psycho, all he was worried about was getting his glove win the next week and making his money. 
that's how it goes. So obviously, after a while, you know, Osito and his lady, they got this arrangement worked out with, with Psycho and his wife. It almost got to a point where it was like Psycho expected his wife to come up once a week. And if something happened, you know, it was an issue. He took it personal. So, you know, it got to the point to where it was almost like he expected things to happen. He expected her to pick his wife up like clockwork. And for the most part, that's what they were doing. They were She was coming up once a week anyway. He had kids and she wanted, you know, she wanted to bring his kids up and she, that's just the kind of, you know, wife he had, the kind that wants to be up there every week. You know, I guess she had the financial means to get up there every week. So that's what she was doing. So anyways, one of the things that Osito would later say is that, you know, it, it got to the point to where Psycho felt almost like entitled, where he felt like, his girl had to come up once a week and bring his wife. And if it didn't, then, you know, there would be some kind of some kind of repercussion. He didn't know what, but that's the way that Psycho started to make him feel. And the other thing he would say was, it was almost like, you know, when it came time to go to a visit, Psycho was on him. He was watching everything that he did, you know, in the cell to make sure that, you know, to watch what he was taking. When he came back, he was watching, you know, what he took out, where he put what, what, what he was opening. So he was on his ass, making sure that things were on the on the up and up, on the legit. And that's the way it was going for a while. They continue, things continue to go on for a while. You know, she continues to bring it up. She continues to carpool with Sykes Old Lady. And again, at one point, I guess she's out there in the visiting room and they pull her aside again and they start to search her. They start going through her stuff. They go through the kids' stuff. And like I said, they do a little bit more than what they do to the people in front of her. And she can see, you know, she's standing in line and she sees how they search the people in front of her. But when it comes to her, you know, they pull her to the side. They put her, put all her stuff on the table and, they, and they're searching her stuff. They're really going through it, trying to find something. So at this point now, she's really starting to feel uncomfortable. She's feeling like somebody's saying something or there's a reason why they're doing this. But now she's starting to feel paranoid and she's having second thoughts about bringing up the dope. But, you know, she doesn't really understand, again, the gravity of the situation, because now you have a Mexican mafia member that is dependent on this. And he's looking forward to this every week. And it's not just it's not going to blow over well if she pulls back especially if he's not okay with it. You know, if Osito gets at him and they talk about it and he's like, hey, bro, my lady's going to take a break for a couple of weeks or whatever until this cools down or it blows over, whatever it is, and they and they agree on that, that's one thing. If, if Sykes is that kind of individual, that kind of Mexican mafia member that, you know, is understanding, then, it, then he's good. Usually, though, when it comes to Carga and you got these old school – Guys like Psycho, the only thing that they're thinking about is getting that dope in. They're not thinking about anybody getting arrested. They're not thinking about anybody, you know, getting caught up or nothing like that. They're just thinking about getting their dope in, getting their quota, making their money, and that's it. Everything else is just, a, you know, they're just servants to their needs, basically. So anyway, on this, on this other occasion, when Osito gets back to the cell, he tells Sykes again about how his lady got searched out there and now she's uncomfortable. And again, he doesn't get the kind of feedback that he's, that he was looking for. He doesn't get that from Sykes. You know, he was hoping that Sykes would tell him like, Hey bro, you know what? Just tell your lady to kick back. Everything will be good in a couple of weeks. Just tell her to kick back. We're good. Especially since he was invested in this, but it never came. All Sykes basically said was, yeah, my wife kind of told me what, what happened. You know, I mean, obviously his girl is carpooling with Osito's wife. So I'm sure they had a conversation about it. Well, whatever they talked about, Sykes' wife, she conveyed that to him and told him that, you know, she's uncomfortable. She's tripping now. Osito's wife didn't tell Sykes' wife that she was going to stop bringing anything in. She didn't go that far, but she just told her that, you know, I'm I'm uncomfortable. There's a reason why they're searching me. They didn't even search Sykes' wife like that. She was the only one that was being singled out. So 
she's paranoid now. So obviously, Osito, he's tripping about his wife. He's concerned about her. They got kids. You know, he's worried about if she gets caught up, who's going to take care of my kids? So when they had the conversation, it just kind of, it falls wayside in the cell. And it just gets kind of, it gets kind of awkward in there. They talk about it, but they don't really talk about it. After that, it's just, it's kind of awkward silence. Anyways, they didn't really come to any kind of resolution that day when they when they talked about it things were just kind of left up in the air and you know if if Osito had any intention on telling Sykes that he was going to stop it didn't come I think he was a little intimidated to tell him even if he wanted to take control of the situation and tell Sykes say you know what bro I'm gonna tell my lady to kick back because I don't want her to get busted and then what's going to happen to my kids my kids are going to end up getting snatched up and it's going to get messy bro if he had any intentions on stepping up and, and telling Sykes that, it didn't come. So, again, after that conversation, things kind of got funny in the cell, but things continued to go on as they had been. So whenever it was a couple days later or the following week, whenever it was, the next time that they had visits, Osito gets called out unexpectedly. He doesn't know that he's got a visit. His lady didn't even tell him that. She was coming up that day. She came up unexpectedly because she wanted to talk to him about this situation and kind of clear the air. They had been arguing and fighting on the phone about it. You know, she wants to stop, but he's telling her, you, you can't stop. You're going to put me in an awkward situation. The brother's not going to understand. The dope still got to come in. We just got to figure out a way to make sure that you don't get caught up. So they're fighting on the phone about it. They're going back and forth and she just pops up one day unexpectedly and he's got a visit so when they call him for a visit Sykes is like what's up bro he's like how come you didn't tell me you got a visit you know he's feeling like this was a missed opportunity for him to have his girl come up and bring him some dope but homeboy didn't tell him about it so he kind of feels played and, and, and Osito's like bro I didn't know I honestly didn't know she was coming up I don't even know if that's my wife she didn't tell me nothing. I talked to her last night. And she didn't say nothing about coming up. So, you know, I don't know. I'll find out and let you know when I get back. So Osito goes out on his visit. And, you know, I, I don't know if they search her again at this point and they're still doing it or if these were just a couple occasions that they did it. It could have been just a specific CO. I don't know those specifics. But, you know, they have a visit. And, again, they're out there in the visiting room and they're, probably talking about this situation. I'm assuming they were. And, you know, his girl, she's like, you know what? I'm not comfortable with doing this right now. She's like, you got to go tell your boy that, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll continue to do this, but for the time being, I'm not going to do nothing for a while. At least, you know, a month or, or two months, I'm going to let things cool down because I got a funny feeling something's going to happen. And Osito, he, you know, he's he's been arguing with her about it, but really he's on board with her because, you know, he's got his kids to think about as well. She gets caught up. His kids are getting they're going to the system. They're going to get caught up and lost in the system. She's going to have to jump through all kind of loops and, and all kind of stuff, especially getting caught, bringing in drugs to a facility like that. And she's got the kids with her. Try to get them kids back. It's going to take a long time. So. You know, he's on board with her. He's really not fighting her. And he intends on going back to the cell and just having a conversation with Cycle. You know, hopefully that, you know, his thinking is hopefully I've been settled up with this brother for a while. We've been cellies. We, 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 you know, we have a good relationship. I'm sure he'll understand. He's got to. I'm, I know he wants his dope, but damn, you know, my lady's going to get busted. There's something going on. So Osito's somewhat confident that that Sykes is going to understand and that they'll at least come to some kind of agreement even if it's just giving her a couple weeks to go ahead and kick back or you know at least she'll bring up she'll still continue to bring up Sykes's lady but when they have the conversation it's basically just Osito talking he goes back to the cell and he tells Sykes he's like look brother he's like you know can I can I, I holler at you about something and Sykes kind of already knows what's going on. This is something that's already been brewing. It's been, you know, in the air for a couple of weeks now. They've been going back and forth about, you know, her 
feeling some kind of way about not wanting to come up. And it's something that he, he's been throwing little things out there, but he stopped short from saying that she wasn't going to come up. So, you know, Sito's telling him, he's like, look, brother, you know, my, my wife, she, she's game. She's game to keep coming up, but she wants to just take a couple of weeks to just kick back. You know, she she's obviously feeling some kind of heat from somewhere, man. They spooked her out there and, you know, I don't want my kids to get snatched up. He's like, come on, you know, Sykes. He was like, you know, can we just give her a couple of weeks? But right now there's really nothing I can do. My, my hands are kind of tied. She doesn't want to bring nothing up. And I've been fighting with her trying to tell her, you know, hey, you still got to do this because at the end of the day, we still got things in here that need to continue to get done. And this is a big part of it right here. You're not understanding, but she's obviously pushing back, but you're not understanding my freedom. What if I get caught up? So Sykes doesn't say nothing at first. He just kind of sits there. And again, there's awkward silence. Sykes just, he looks at Osito and he tells him, he goes, well, you know what, bro? He's like, if she don't want to continue to bring the cloud win for us, if she don't want to continue to do it, then she don't need to come up here no more. Period. And furthermore, if she don't want to continue helping us like this, she don't need to come up here and see you either. She should have thought about this before she started bringing this in. She's been doing it. It's something that we need now. She can't now all of a sudden just say, you know what? I don't want to do it no more. It doesn't work like that. She shouldn't have never got involved in this in the first place. So too bad. You know, again, if she doesn't want to, she doesn't want to bring, bring this up, tell her don't come up here no more. She can't even come up here and see you either. So obviously Osito's, he's like, damn, you know, he don't know what to say. So he don't really say nothing. What can he say? If he pushes back, obviously Sykes is going to have him. He's going to have him knocked down. So he's got to pick his words and what he says very carefully. Now Sykes is pissed off. He's he's worried about his globo. And that's the only thing he's worried about. He don't care about homeboy's lady. He's worried about his globo coming in next week. So, you know, it, it, there's awkward silence in the cell. They don't say nothing to each other for the rest of the night. The next day, you know, they continue to go on with their daily routine. Homeboy goes to work and, you know, he comes back. And at some point during the day, they come to the cell and they, told, they tell Osito, pack your shit. You got a cell move. And Osito's like, what? Cell move? What are you talking about? Where, where am I moving to? So they tell Osito that he's moving to D facility. And he got completely blindsided with this. He didn't put in for no cell move. He didn't know nothing about no cell move. He's been on this yard for a while now. I don't know exactly how long, but they had been out there for a while. It sounded like they were out there for at least a year, a couple of years. So obviously, as soon as the CO leaves, Osito looks at Sykes and he's like, he's like, what's going on, bro? He's like, why are they moving me? And Sykes, Sykes knows, Sykes knows what's going on. But he tells Osito, he's like, I, I don't know, bro. I don't know what's going on. He's like, I don't know. Maybe, you know, maybe they just, they want to pull you over there to the other yard. He's like, you know, I didn't, I didn't even know about that until right now myself. When in actuality, Sykes is the one that had to move. You know, it's, it's, it's very common for Mexican mafia members that have a lot of status NF members that have a lot of status, AB members, even BGF members. Me, myself, when I was active, it was common for us to have juice as far as moving people, having people move, having homeboys move in to, to different cells or, you know, having somebody move in to another building. But I guess he had the juice to have somebody move from one yard to the, <laughs> to the next. So Osito's blindsided. He don't know why he's moving. Sykes, he, he plays it off like he doesn't know. And Osito's in there packing his stuff. So he's packing and he's getting ready to go to D facility. So Sykes starts striking up a kite. He's like, hey, you know what? Since you're going to go over there to DR, you might as well deliver this, this, this wheeler I got that's going to Dedico from, from Bassett. So Dedico from Bassett is over there with another Mexican mafia member 
by the name of Huero Caballo from West Side 18th Street. Now, so like I said, Osito's from North Side 18th Street. So, you know, he knows Huero Caballo's over there and he feels like he's got an ally over there. And basically when he gets over there, he has every intention on touching base with Huero Caballo to let him know, you know, they're both from 18th Street. Hey, look, this is what happened over there. I'm, I'm you know, I'm over there with, with, with your brother. I'm hitting, I'm doing everything that's expected of me. And this situation ends up taking place with my wife. And this is what ends up happening right here. So, you know, he has every intention on, on tapping in with his home. Now, there's also another Mexican Mafia member that's on CR with Psycho. And that's an individual by the name of Richie from Otay, San Diego. So they're out there together. And, you know, like I said, Sykes striking up this kite so that when Osito gets over there, he can deliver it to Terco from, from Bassett. So Osito's packing his stuff oblivious to what's going on. He's oblivious to everything that's going on around him. The writing's on the wall. He should have known what was going on. He should have known that common sense will tell you that somebody like Sykes knows everything that's happening on that yard, especially if it pertains to his cell. If his cell is moving, he's going to know about it. But Osito, you know, when, when, when Sykes played stupid, Osito sucked it up. The other thing is when Sykes started striking up that kite, Osito should have knew right there that that was his removal kite. Why he didn't figure that out or put two and two together, I don't know. But he was oblivious to it, and, you know, I don't know what his thinking was. Maybe he just thought that Sykes was just reaching out to Tedico about some dope, or maybe it was just some business, something else that didn't pertain to him. But, you know, Sykes, he, he strikes that kite up, he seals it up, he gives it to Osito. Now, Osito, maybe he would have opened up that kite. But he's somebody that's been around for a while. And he had also been in the cell with Sykes and he knew how he, you know, he knew his, his routine. And he also knew that Sykes also had a, you know, he had priors for booby trapping his kites. And I used to do the same thing. I would seal my kites a certain way. I would wrap them a certain way. Or there would be so many, so many times that I would tie them. Or there'd be so many pieces of cellophane around the kite that it would be booby trapped. So if somebody opened it up, so I would know and whoever was receiving that kite would know if it was tampered with. They would know if somebody opened it up and it, it was breached. So those are things that you, you do for security reasons. And this right here, you know, maybe he would have opened it up if he didn't know that Sykes was doing that because he was suspicious about it. Later on, he would say that, you know, later on he would talk to my guy and he would tell him that, you know, he, he kind of felt like something was going on, but he really didn't feel like he'd done anything wrong. He was looking out for the, you know, for the brother. He was getting dope. He was having his his wife bring up, you know, Sykes' wife. So he was doing everything he was supposed to. The only thing that he did wrong, according to Sykes, is looking out for his old lady, looking out for her best interest. That's what he was guilty of. And because of that, and because he interfered with Sykes' dope coming in, that right there was enough to go ahead and expel this individual. It's a cold game. You know, it's a cold game. When you're productive and you're, you're, you're winning and you're out there making money and you're, you're doing good things for the organization, you're held in high regards and you're embraced because, you're, you know, you're a, you're a breadwinner. You're somebody that's bringing in the glavo and they like that. But the minute you end up in a situation where you're no longer able to be productive, where you're not bringing in dope, where you're not bringing in money, you're not being productive out there, you're not generating you know, revenue, you're automatically looked at as a liability. So now Osito had become a liability to Psycho. And, you know, again, he kind of felt like something was up, but he honestly didn't feel like he'd done nothing wrong. And he really didn't. But that's just how cutthroat politics that's that's how cutthroat politics are anyway so you know Cito ends up packing all his stuff up and he gets shipped over to to dr he ends up getting over there and you know at one point he runs in the terco he gives him the one time from sykes and then at one point 
he goes to Weddle Caballo and he lets him know everything that happened. You know, he lets him know that he was sold up with Sykes, that they were hitting, what happened in the visiting room. His lady got spooked. And basically Sykes got upset with him because, you know, his old lady got spooked. She got scared. She didn't want to bring in the dope anymore. So Weddle Caballo, he tells him, you know, He's like, let me look into it. I'll get back at you. Don't worry about it. Just, you know, go ahead and get yourself situated out here, but don't trip. You know, I'm going to holler at him. I understand he's probably just frustrated. It happens. You know what I mean? Things like that happen all the time, but it's nothing to get yourself all, you know, worked up about because obviously Osito kind of felt like something was going to happen. He kind of felt like the walls were kind of closing in on him and, you know, he, he really had done nothing wrong at that point. Anyway, so, you know, when I when I think about it, when I think about just everything that happened and as my guy was telling me the story, I kind of wonder why, why would it be necessary for Cycle to strike up this kite when it's obvious he had a cell phone. He had a cell phone and I'm sure he was tapping in with Derko on the other yard. They were in communication they were networked that was something that you know my guy had also told me so I don't understand why he had to physically bring this kite over there I don't I don't know instead of just calling them on the phone and letting them know hey you're going to get somebody over there that just left over from over here this is who this individual is and go ahead and and, and have him whacked so I, I don't understand why it was necessary for him to write that one time, but obviously it was. I don't know. I wasn't there. So anyways, you know, Osito's over there. He's on the yard. He's there for a couple of days. And again, he's seen the writing on the wall. And it was because of the lack of acknowledgement that he was getting from the other Sureños over there. You know, when you get to a new yard and you're new out there and everybody out there knows, you know, when somebody new comes to the yard, you can get a a feel of you know the the vibe out there by by how you're embraced or by how you're acknowledged and usually when when you're new out there and you're somebody that's been programming like Osito the other Sureños will get at him like they they get at him with love and respect they what's up brother you know I me mean? welcome to the yard and you know where you coming from and, you know they 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 they're social they they would embrace him and they would acknowledge him, but he wasn't getting that. It was he was getting a lot of stares. They were just giving him the head nod, like "What's up," you know. And because of that, he felt like something was in the air. He could feel the tension. So you know, you got to understand. He's probably thinking like, "Man, this is messed up." Again, I did everything that I thought I was doing everything right. I was helping the brother. I was bringing, you know, having my wife bring his wife up. He was, you know, everything was going cool. And because my wife, you know, she wants to take a couple week reprieve because she felt uncomfortable. All this is happening. There's no doubt that me getting bounced around from C yard to, to D yard. It all has something to do with it. You know, just a couple of days ago, I was over there with, with, with Psycho and everything was cool. We're throwing spreads. We're having it our way over there. I'm winning. And now, you know, I feel like everything just went to shit. So all he can really do is just kind of just go with the flow and hope that Terco and, and Huero Caballo will somehow resolve this issue because they're going to have conversations with Psycho and they're going to have, a, they're going to make a decision one way or the other. So anyways, they don't do nothing for the first couple of days. Osito's out there for about a week. And, you know, he goes out there to the yard every day because that was a policy. My guy told me that, you know, one of the policies was you didn't have to stay out there on the yard all day, but you had to make an appearance out there. At least once in the morning, you had to go out there and make an appearance, make sure that everything was, was straight out there, nothing was going on. And then you were able to go in your building or go to your cell, you know, do do whatever you wanted to do. But you had to at least make that appearance once in the morning. So he goes out that morning, he makes his appearance, and he goes back to the cell. He goes to his building. He's in, he's in the building, and he's getting ready to go in the cell when he's approached by a sureño. 
another Sureño that tells him, hey, they're they're requesting that you go back out to the yard. They want you out there. So again, oblivious to what's going on. That right there should have definitely told him something's about to happen. He should have just took off, you know, and, I, and you know what? I say that, but at the same time, it's just not that easy. I'm going to be honest with you. Even though if that I would have been Osito, even though I would have probably felt the same way, something's going on. Something's going on. I feel like they're about to make a bad call that I might get hit because of this. And it's, it's wrong. It's clearly, it's some dirty politics, but it's not as easy as just going out there and just taking off on somebody, even though you're feeling like that's what's about to happen. Because if you're a true believer, you, you value your status. You don't want to fall in bad standing. So it's not just that easy. What if you're wrong? What if that sixth sense that you're feeling is wrong? You go out there and you make a mistake. You take off on somebody and now you just definitely ruined your career. There's no coming back for that. You're, you're not going to be able to tell somebody I got paranoid. I thought something was up and, and I just, I did what I did because, you know, I had to, I, I wasn't trying to be a, a sitting duck. It's, it's not going to, it's not, it's going to fall on deaf ears. So anyways, Osito goes back out to the yard. He goes back out to the yard and they basically, they lure him out to the middle of the yard, all the way out to the middle of the yard. And High Desert is one of those prisons that they don't, they're not known for giving warning shots. You guys see, you guys, I'm sure see what happens in the media all the time. People are getting killed out there all the time. Look at Mondo Quinn and the other guy, they both got killed stabbing somebody. So they're not, they're not known for giving warning shots. If somebody's getting hit out there and they see a weapon, they're taking headshots. They're going to try to kill you. So with that in mind, these guys lure them out to the middle of the yard. And what they do is they build a scrimmage. They construct a scrimmage, a wall of bodies, so that when they get on this dude, they send a couple of torpedoes on him. When they start hitting him, the gunner can't really see what's happening. They can see something's happening, but they can't really see the, you know, that this guy's getting hit with weapons. And because of that, they're not just going to start shooting people in the back. If they can't see on the other side of them, what are they going to do? So, you know, that's what they did. They, they, they constructed this scrimmage where they're standing there and he's getting, he's getting butchered. They go in on them hard. The two guys that they send on them, they know what they're doing. They almost kill him. So at some point, they obviously realize what's going on, and they prone the yard out, and Osito's, he's laid out. He's close to death. They almost, like I said, they almost killed him. They come out there. I don't know if he got medevaced out, but they come out there. They take him off the yard, and they take him to the hospital. He spent a significant amount of time in the hospital. He lost a lung. He was paralyzed temporarily for a couple of months. He couldn't walk. The bone crushers that they hit him with, what they did was when they made them, they left these jagged edges on the other side, which is a it's a common thing when you're when you're making those bone crushers. When you have those big flat pieces of steel, you just make some jagged edges on the other side, just some grooves so that when you're stabbing somebody, when you go to pull out, it just it tears your insides up and it pulls shit out. Well, he was hit so bad that he, some of his intestines were hanging out on the yard. That's how bad he was hit. So anyways, for the next four months, he's on a colostomy bag. They had to staple his intestines. They had to cut out a lot of his stomach. And he went through multiple surgeries. And like I said, it was around four months before he could even move and walk again. He was temporarily paralyzed. At first, they didn't even know if he was going to be able to walk again. So they 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 did some some damage to him. So according to my guy, he told me that Osito was on liquid diet, a liquid diet for about four months. And, you know, there was only certain things that he could eat. And he was just he was messed up bad. And because they cut out so much of his stomach, he could only eat a very like his stomach was it shrunk. So there was only he only had a little bit of his stomach left. And according to what my guy said, he was like, man, oh boy could only eat one taco when he was full. 
he couldn't eat no more than that. He would eat a little bit and he was full. And then again, he had a colostomy bag for four months. That right there is not only physically to go through something like that is it's crucial. It's it's grueling, but it's also physically, you know, it's something that physically will affect you. A colostomy bag, you're paralyzed. When you go through a, a, a situation like that, that could be a life changing situation for a lot of people. You know, this guy came close to death. He was knocking on death's door. But anyways, the, the kicker to all this is that after, after Osito got moved on and after he recovered and he he landed wherever he landed, I'm sure at one point he landed on an S and Y somewhere. He was in the hat. He was done. The kicker in all this is that the day that they hit him, they called his wife. They called his wife. I don't know who called her, but somebody called her and, you know, they did a good smut job on him. They told him, hey, you know, your guy, is he's got all kind of sanchas. He's been writing all kind of females and, you know, he's on the phone all the time with all these different women. He doesn't love you. And this is what he says about you. And they straight just dirty Mac them. And they also told her that, you know, he's a target now. And if you're going to continue to stay with this individual, then you need to move because you're going to be a target as well. They scared the shit out of her. So she ended up moving. She moved. She cut him loose because of that. For a while, he couldn't even get a hold of it, of his wife. He actually had to have his sister run her down, locate her, and tell her what really happened. But, you know, this is a crazy story. Again, it's it's one of those stories where you get to see how dirty the politics are. You know, we all know as gang members that we're expendable. We all know that for any given reason that we can be hit behind somebody's ego, behind somebody's drugs, behind money. There's a lot of different things that come into play, but everybody's expendable. It doesn't matter who you are, how high up you are on that ladder. I know this myself. We're all expendable. You know, there's a message in this story right here. And the message is this. I don't ever tell nobody not to join gangs. I don't advocate against gangs. But for those of you that glorify this lifestyle, for those of you that, you know, aspire to be a member of the Mexican Mafia or a member of the Nuestra Familia, for those of you that want to get hooked up, this story right here should make you have second thoughts because here's an individual that was doing everything right. He was somebody that was, you know, trying to make money for the Mexican Mafia. He was in the cell with the Mexican Mafia member. He was doing everything that he was asked to do. He was, you know, going that extra mile to be just a good sureño to make sure that they had drugs coming in, to make sure that, you know, they were self-solvent, self-supporting out there on that yard, and that he was a part of, you know, the the, the money-making process out there. He was he was a part of that that circle, that inner circle out there. But it didn't matter in, in the in the long run, it didn't matter that he'd done everything right because he wanted to look out for his wife and he thought about the best interests of his kids. He ends up getting tossed aside like a like a piece of shit. And then if that wasn't bad enough, then they butchered him and tried to kill him. You gotta ask yourself, why? Why would they go that far to do something like that? Just because. He didn't bring in the global or because it interrupted or interfered with Sykes, you know, his program. That's crazy. That should show you what kind of love that, you know, certain individuals that are high up in position, what kind of love that they have for their people. You know, it's crazy that Sykes would want to turn on, on Osito like that. And I'm sure they had bonded in the cell. They were cellies. They broke bread. They were in there throwing spreads. They were in there chopping it up, conversating. You know, their wives used to come up all the time. So they had a bond. But because at one point, Osito's wife, you know, she did what she was supposed to do. She's thinking about the best interests of her kids. She's lucky that she was even doing that. But, you know, she gets smart. She uses her brain. And 
she wants to step back for a while, which is the right thing to do to let things cool down. And because of that, look what happens to Osito. It's crazy. It's another one of those stories that makes you just say, damn, man, politics or something else. And the yards are full of Ositos out there. They're full of them. All these S and Y yards, they're full of guys just like him that really didn't do nothing to really damage the organization. Didn't, you know, hurt nobody. Didn't do nothing like that. But because they hindered somebody's progress or they interfered with somebody's bag or because they didn't bring in somebody's dope, now they're sitting out there all scarred up. You know, this guy can only hold down a taco. <laughs> He can only eat one taco now and he's full. And from what my guy told me, he's bitter now. He's bitter. He's like, man, you know what? I wish they would have just killed me out there. I wish they would have just, you know, I would have died because going through everything that I went through, them cutting my stomach out, my tripas hanging out, you know, me being only being able to eat like just a little bit, the colostomy bag, he was like, I just wanted to die. It was one of the worst things that one of the worst things he had to experience but anyways it is what it is it's a little bit of reality for you guys but anyways this pretty much wraps this one up that's what happened to osito from 18th street north side 18th street i'm gonna have another one for you guys tomorrow hopefully i'll get it early enough to where i can get it out to you guys tomorrow night it's gonna be about mosca fly the mexican mafia member that just recently got killed himself. But this was about something that he did when he was still active, when he was still in good standings. It's another banger, trust me. Anyways, I hope you guys are enjoying these stories. I got out in Inner Demons for you guys last night. Shout out to Sandman. He's been editing all these videos and he's been putting in a lot of work. So, you know, shout out to him for the work that he's been putting in, going that extra mile, trying to get you guys the chapters, all the videos that I've been shooting them. So, you know, he's been doing his thing and we're trying to get out as much content to you guys as we possibly can. We're trying to grow. Shout out to Paradigm Media News. We finally made our 35,000. Damn, it was a fight to get up there. Shout out to all those channels that, you know, are growing and continue to grow. You know, it's been a slow process for us, but we're good with that. We'll take you know, we'll take the numbers that we get and we're happy with it. We're not in no competition. We're not in no race. But anyways, thank you guys for helping us get to 35,000. It's an achievement for us. And again, like I said, we'll take it. But anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this story. Again, I'm going to have another one for you guys tomorrow. With that being said, this is your boy Box and I'm out.